comedy and gag manga are a genre of manga that, in the grand scheme of the fandom, is seldom discussed. You might see it pop up here and there in someone's top 10 favourites. It might contain an odd gag manga or two, but compared to a lot of other ongoing manga, it's rarely touched on. It makes sense as often these works lack the action, drama, or hype moments that compel people to talk about them week to week. Yet comedy manga still exists, they still get published, and people still read them. And don't get me wrong, it's not like they aren't talked about at all, but still I think they deserve more praise and a bigger spotlight on them. It's also hard to talk about them in a vacuum as well. If you make videos like me, making a small video on a comedy manga might not feel worth it creatively, and trying to dissect jokes can be hard and sometimes fruitless because explaining jokes over and over isn't always funny and it doesn't make for engaging conversation. It's also often a tricky topic to discuss since not everyone finds the same things funny. A poop joke to one person could be the funniest thing in the world and it might just piss off someone else for being too dumb. But what if we tackled gag manga on a bigger scale? What if we looked at tons of different manga in an attempt to show that it's a diverse and fun genre that deserves more praise and attention? To do that, I've gotten in touch with 19 other creators, ranging from other YouTubers, artists, and those who love comedy manga and just want to gush about it. Regardless of subscriber number, or even if they have a channel in the first place, it was important to me to get other people to talk about what they find funny and interesting about their favourite goofy manga. So look forward to hearing from them throughout the video. There'll be timestamps in the description as well for each participant if you'd like to quickly jump around to specific ones and then at the very end I'll be thanking everyone individually one by one, so stay tuned for that too. But now that I've mentioned variety in gag manga, let's talk a little bit about manga demographics and magazines. Usually a manga is often categorised into four demographics. There are more and I'm vastly oversimplifying all of this, but we have shonen for younger males, seinen for older males, shoujo for younger females, and jose for older females. These determine what kind of works will be in a given magazine usually, and what age group slash type of person they're orientated to. This doesn't mean boys can't read shoujo and vice versa, and sometimes manga do break the mould of the magazines they're in a bit, but I can tell you that one thing is common to all of these demographics and most magazines, and that's that comedy or gag manga will likely be present, and if not, some of those manga will surely have comedic elements because comedy is universal. Comedy can worm its way into other series as I've just mentioned, but it's also not uncommon to see it as the focus. For shonen manga we have full on gag manga like me and Roboco, which is all about making you laugh with smaller gags or long full chapter jokes. Seinen, the demographic people associate with gritty manga like Berserk, Vagabond, and Vinland Saga, is full of cutesy silly comedies like Young Jumps, the 100 girlfriends who really 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 love you, which is exactly what it sounds like. It's a rom-com where the protagonist gets 100 girlfriends and it relishes in the absurdness and stupidity of this idea. While I'm not too well versed in shoujo or jose manga generally, shoujo has a lot of rom-coms, but one gag manga I can point to as being funny with not much romance, or any romance at all, is Furo Kyodai from Hana to Yume. It's a work that only lasted one volume, but sees two twins, Kyoko and Daisuke, who are inseparable. They bathe together, they go to the toilet together, and should they leave each other's side, they'll be haunted by ghosts due to their high spiritual potential. It may seem a bit weird, but it's genuinely really funny and endearing how much they need to cling to each other. Them discussing what they would do if one of them died, which is an incredibly morose topic, is made hilarious due to their predicament and Yuki Shiwasu's ability to draw some really funny expressions. They also share part of this discussion while one of them is using the toilet and the other one is outside the door, which just made me really crack up. There's also a bit more to this one with some cool horror and drama aspects, but predominantly the comedic parts are the focus and are really strong. It's such a short read, I definitely recommend people check this one out. Jose put me into a bit of a pickle to find something, to be honest. Partly, I think, due to the concept of Jose being a little nebulous and hard to pin down, I won't go into specifics of it because I don't honestly understand it fully, and it's an area I need to research more, but from what I've heard, 
Pink by Kyoko Okazaki might be an interesting and more adult-oriented comedy, which I'd love to read someday, and it probably is very different to any manga I've mentioned so far. While we don't really have many or any examples of shoujo or jose manga from everyone collaborating today, we do have a lot of variety within the shonen and seinen demographics, so let's see what kind of manga our friends have to share. While the anime for Bochi the Rock has most deservingly been given its flowers, not nearly enough credit has been given to the source material manga, the medium that gave Bochi the Rock its strongest components for comedy, those components being the incredible cast. While a character's personality being a part of the joke setup is fairly standard for comedy manga, especially for comma where space is hard to come by, it's Bochi the Rock's absolute proficiency with this method that truly shines. Each character has the perfect personality to bounce comedically off each other in the different situations they find themselves in as an underground band made up of high schoolers. Hitori Goto is a socially anxious and socially unaware shut-in, Ryo tries really hard to come off as eccentric, Kida is almost obnoxiously extroverted, and Nijikai seems to play the straight man in a lot of scenarios. Each of these characters are absolute comedy explosions just waiting for the catalyst to come along. Like how Hitori, nicknamed Bochi, had no friends. <laughs> no, no, I promise this is funny. When she took a picture of her bandmates, she got upset with it and printed it all over her room. It's funny, sudden, and all the setup was there. To raise the joke efficiency, that very joke is turned into a scenario as there is a reoccurring bit where more and more of the band members see it and act accordingly to each of their personalities. And none of this touches how much musical passion is crammed into these panels. Real thought goes into each character's equipment, and it's also really interesting how each chapter starts with a replication of musical iconography with swapped out Kasoku band members. Bochi the Rock is a hilarious and passion-filled series that I can't do proper justice in a just two-minute segment, but I recommend it so much, and I don't know how to end this, I like Bochi the Rock. And to contrast and show how different manga in the same demographics can be, here's Inspirashimu with their segment. Yo, Shamu, here's your mic. Huh? Me too. <laughs> Alright, let's do this. Humor is rooted in cultural context, and Grand Blue Dreaming is rooted deep within that type of college experience that you had or you have envisioned. Featuring idiots, alcohol, and <laughs> idiots drinking said alcohol. When I got into the series during the pandemic, the nostalgia sucked me right back into my rose-colored college days of joining a random club like diving just to end up drinking all the time blocking my friends for the hell of it, or running insane experiments just to mess around and not actually study that hard for my classes. This crass and very crude comedy is exactly the type of stuff that gets me to do more than just blow some air through my nostrils as both the anime and the manga have been the hardest I've ever laughed while reading or watching something. If you're a fan of let's say Konosuba or even Gintama, this series should be right up your alley. Give that first episode a shot so you can at least associate these voices uh, to see if you want to continue watching or maybe pick up a volume. For me though, I'll go back to my karaoke. My friends, When it came to demographics, I also mentioned there's more than just four. But wait, there's more. And children's manga often comes in its own magazines, like Koro Koro Comic. This is where you'll find a lot of gag manga, as it's popular with children. Notable examples include Doraemon and even the Among Us manga. Pepperoni. While some children will often buy shonen magazines to read their gag manga, these children publications are very important and are more child friendly and aimed at younger kids and probably give their parents some relief because some hyper violent series like Jujutsu Kaisen or some overly etchy series like Ayakashi Triangle isn't going to appear there. One such magazine is a monthly comic Bun Bun, which serialized Leave It to Pet, which I'm going to let Mask tell you about. Hello everyone, my name is Mark, and imagine yourself in your elementary school library 
and you're walking through the graphic novel section, and this little book catches your eye. And that little book is Leave It to Pet. This short comedy manga by Kenji Sonishi follows the titular Pet, a recycled bottle robot who helps a kid named Noboru who recycled him along with other recycled robots and their zany misadventures. This series lasted four volumes with 77 chapters, though out of all of these, my school library only had volume one. Since my memories of this manga extend to only the first volume, I reread it just the other day and a lot of the jokes still had me chuckling. It's nothing more than a really silly manga and that's all it needs to be. I might even check out the other volumes. There's a very specific chapter that I remember where Noboru, the kid Pet Protects, pushes for a dog and Pet makes a bottle doggy, who's just a normal bottle with dog features. Then at the end, he transforms into a weird dog hybrid and freaks out Noboru. There's a bunch of silly characters that I so strongly remember. Like Plaz, a plastic box who Pet bullies because he's more helpful than him, or Pet's sister Alu, who somehow always makes the situation intensely violent. Each robot character is super unique, but that cannot be said about the human characters who are fairly one note. I'm really surprised this is one of my first manga ever, and later down the line, I had an aversion to gag manga. Though with new series out like Super Psychic Policeman Shoujo and Kyoshi's Exorcist, I've learned to love gag manga as much as any other demographic. And I can thank Pet for that. Although I'd love to really dig into the nitty gritty of comedy manga in manga history, the scope of this video is already huge, but comedy has always played a role in things like comic strips, so I can imagine that manga is no exception. Digging through some of those really old ones might be difficult, but one of the oldest manga I have come across is 1940s Nakayoshi Techo by Machiko Hasegawa. It followed a schoolgirl called Umeko after transferring, where she'd make new friends, with it being a mix of slice of life and comedy. Furthermore, Hasegawa would go on to create The Wonderful World of Sazai-san, a manga that went on for over 6,000 chapters. It did this since it was a 4 comma or 4 panel gag manga. Originally starting in 1946 in Hasegawa's hometown newspaper before moving to Asahi Shimbun, a Tokyo newspaper, it saw Hasegawa as well as Sazai-san and family move to Tokyo as well. It had a long run, but its anime is even longer, with it beginning in 1969 and it's still running to this day, being the longest running animated TV series ever. More comedy manga would follow, with Doraemon being a big one, beginning in the December of 1969, following a cat-like robot who would take mysterious tools out of their pocket, which would be the focus or of help in its chapters. It's a work that has greatly influenced comedy manga till this day, with some jump manga like The Gutsy Frog, Magical Taro Taro, or Me and Roboco coming to mind when I think of it. And since I just mentioned three shonen jump manga from various periods of its publication, let's discuss its history with comedy manga since it's by far the magazine I'm most comfortable with. From the very beginning, gag manga were a pillar of the magazine, with one of its biggest hits being Harenchi Gakuen or Shameless School by Gon Lagai. It's a school manga with a lot of etchy elements and it's had its fair share of controversy even leaving the magazine for a period after parent-teacher associations were displeased with it, but it kept people reading and talking about Jump and is credited as a big contributor to ecchi manga as a movement and genre. Without it, it's also a distinct possibility that Shonen Jump as we know it wouldn't be the same or flat out wouldn't exist. As the magazine grew up though, countless manga would come and go, but gag manga would again act as a pillar of stability for the magazine, with the 70s being filled with the likes of Manga Conte 55 Go, a work that from my understanding adapted or used real life comedians for its material. As well as this, Harenchi Gakuen would inspire some more crude humour with works like Dr. Toilet, which as you can guess is all about poop. Come on, sit in the Gutsy Frog was also there, and it was a pretty cute manga about a boy who gets a frog called Pionkichi stuck to his t-shirt. Some of this has been translated and there's also an anime, and it's one I'd recommend people check out, as well as Harenchi Gakuen. It's dated, but it's partially translated from my understanding something I didn't have the luxury of reading when I first talked about it in my very first History of Shonen Jump video. By far the biggest example of gag manga in Jump and one that's been with it for the majority of its lifespan is Kochikame. Beginning in 1976, it's not only the longest manga to run in Weekly Shonen Jump, ending in 2016, lasting 40 whole years, but also one of the longest manga period. 
it lasted throughout Jump's Golden Age, from Dragon Ball's beginning and end, from One Piece beginning, the new millennium beginning, and works like My Hero Academia and Black Clover beginning. Kochikame was there the entire time. Ryotsu, the goofy police officer, was a massive staple of Jump, with its author, Osamu Akimoto, rarely missing a week, and I think this is a massive appeal of gag manga. It's fairly consistent. Sure, jokes waver and one week's chapter might not be as funny as the next, but works like Kojikame, Sazai-san, and Doraemon were serialized for years or even decades. You could be a child attending school reading these manga, and in a decade, be an adult with these works still being published. With how confusing and harsh life can be, it's nice when there's consistency and a chapter of something funny every single week that's familiar to you probably would make you pretty happy. You may take it for granted, but the relationship you build with long-running media like this can be especially powerful. Having something you can enjoy and maybe even hold nostalgia for is really sweet. I can imagine older Jump readers sticking to the magazine because of series like Kochikame, or parents showing their children what it is, who might also enjoy it, and then check out other manga in the magazine as well, which are more aimed at their generation. It makes sense from a business standpoint, they help cultivate new readers and old ones stick around, and even though comedy manga tend to not sell gangbusters in volume sales, they most likely contribute to magazine sales a lot because people want to read the newest silly chapter of the funny comedy manga they like, as well as some cool action stuff. On a human level though, I think the people in charge of manga magazines and Jump especially still have a lot of heart and recognize the value of series like Kochikame and Me and Roboco. Comedy has strong ties to Jump, and its potential to make people laugh and be happy is important. Jump's Golden Age, which is often characterized with works full of action, like Fist of the North Star, Saint Seiya, Ginga, City Hunter, and Dragon Ball, also saw Kochikame, Shape Up Ran, Suide ni Tonchinkan, and High School Kumengumi running parallel with most of these. Comedy and gag manga were as pivotal to the magazine's success as some of its most fondly remembered hits. And a manga that debuted just before this period of time straddles the line between being fondly remembered and a comedic masterpiece. This would be Akira Toriyama's Dr. Slump, but I'll let Joe Carter tell you their thoughts on it. After the passing of Toriyama, I started my long-awaited reread of Dr. Slump. The first time I read the story, I just couldn't put it down. The manga is super addicting to read with every chapter having a short page count and tackling a new silly topic each time. Whether it's a new invention by Senbei or Arale making a new friend, you'll always encounter something refreshing. Which is the strength that all of these episodic gag manga have. Also if you think Dragon Ball forgot about its sidecast, then Dr. Slump will make it seem like Yamcha was actually a relevant character. Though it doesn't matter because the best character in the series, Gachan the Cherub, is always present to overwhelm you with cuteness. The manga is just very cute, which is a big appeal of the series. Toriyama loves illustrating first and foremost. Even if you don't read the text, the visuals are so charming. Not a single panel has empty space, as the author will always add some fun cute character or creature. It is so good. Rereading the series after Toriyama's passing, it added a new layer to the manga. Seeing the author's aloof and humble personality shine while knowing all that he has done for the world and the fact that he isn't with us anymore, it does a lot for this silly comic. The volume extras allow you to take a look into Toriyama's life over the course of Dr. Slump's serialization. From his assistant changing halfway through the series, to Toriyama getting married and coming up with an idea for his next manga. Toriyama even appears in the story himself as a character to host a race for the citizens of Penguin Village. Or to just generally poke fun at himself. Because of all of this, it feels like Toriyama is right alongside you as you read his story. You can tell that Oda was influenced by this too. Toriyama loves to insert his hobbies into the story as well such as the vinyl volume being full of motorcycle stories, seemingly because Toriyama was getting tired of the series, so he just inserted his one true love while he had to continue writing out the final chapters of Dr. Slump. All in all, Dr. Slump is awesome and worth checking out. It gets good consistently in volume 2 in my opinion, so keep going for a bit if volume 1 doesn't strongly hook you. It's like a decent 8 out of 10. Rest in peace Akira Toriyama, you are number 1. Hoyoyo? Dr. Slump still being beloved even till this day makes me eternally happy since it's such a cute and great manga. And another one from Shonen Jump during this period which I cannot resist talking about is Stop Me Barracoon. Thankfully it's seen a bit of a resurgence as of recent due to its premise being a shonen comedy manga about a trans girl. 
It has just as much cuteness and great art as Dr. Slump, with Hibari being such a wonderful and lovable character who is effortlessly cool, funny, and fashionable. The one thing dragging it down are some not so culturally or socially appropriate jokes concerning race, which you will see from comedy manga of this period, sadly. I won't bog down the whole video with a segment on inappropriate comedy from manga, but there is quite a lot of it that just doesn't hold up. But surprisingly, the treatment of Hibari is pretty good, with some misgendering her or being confrontational about her identity, but the manga always puts those characters in a negative light and props up Hibari as the goofy queen she is. It's a manga that used comedy elements in a fun way to explore gender queer identity in a time and place you might not expect. Okay, now that Hibari is out of my system, let's have some cool folks tell you about their favourite Shonen Jump comedy manga. Gintama, it's a comedy manga about how during the Bakamatsu era, aliens invade Japan. So a lot of jokes based on the samurai culture, sci-fi technology, and different types of aliens. Gintama also loved to do parodies of other mangas, anime, and video games. As example for my favorite comedy routine in Gintama, I'm gonna choose the Ultimate Toilet Battle, when four men playing four-dimensional chess trying to find something to wipe their butts. Another bigger example of my favorite comedy for Gintama will be character pool arc. After popularity pool get released, some characters very unhappy and they try to fix this by any means necessary. They fight each other, betray each other, build the alliances in attempt to get higher on the list and asking the meta question why the fuck some of them much higher despite having the less time in the manga. Ultimately, Heart of Gintama is their three main characters, Kagura, Shinpachi and Gintoki. Their chemistry between each other and interaction with the side cast is just great. Also, watch anime version of Gintama. It's better than manga. What? One of my favorite comedy manga of all time is Sket Dance. It's been a series I've wanted to recommend for some time now, as not only was it a favorite when I hadn't seen many non-action titles, but even after expanding my tastes and experiencing the manga, it's retained an unshakable place in my top 10 so I appreciate the opportunity. Sket Dance in Simplified Terms is a comedy drama series that at one moment can make you cry from laughter and the next can hit you in the gut with a heartfelt moment. The dime switching style is a lot like Gintama, as series creator Kenta Shinohara was his assistant. What I like most about Sket Dance is just how kind the series is. As the entire conceit of it is, a trio who runs a high school club to support students with their problems. In spite of the main trio being goofballs, they're quick to give emotional support to anyone who needs it, never belittling or ignoring someone for sincerely calling out for help. What enhances both the comedy and drama is the Sketdan all harboring trauma from their own individual circumstances that gets slowly revealed throughout the story. So you can become more invested in the moments they can just be big dumbasses having fun because they deserve it or be invested in their sheer determination to make a difference. To quickly highlight two of my favorite chapters on opposite ends, 109 is probably the funniest thing I've read. I'm not usually a big poop joke guy, but this chapter still gets me every time. Not only is the concept relatable, with Basun needing to shit, but having everything in the world get in his way, but Shinohara draws the exact walk you do when you're really holding a shit in. Furthermore, the chapter just escalates perfectly going from toilets at school being clogged to walking in on a robbery when trying to use a convenience store bathroom before ending with this funny as fuck page of Basun starting to take his pants down so he can use the bathroom as soon as he gets inside his house only to get the wrong address and have a lady completely misinterpret what's going on. 249 is one of my other favorites. It's the second to last chapter of Switch On, an arc detailing how Switch 
the final member of the trio, join the group. To keep the spoilers light, I love this chapter for just how intense things get when Basun and Himiko try to save Switch from himself. This double page spread speaks for itself. In July of 1997, a manga released in Shonen Jump that would change the world forever. That manga was Sekamatsu Leader Den Takashi! This manga is a gag comedy series that was written by Mitsutoshu Shimabukuro, who would later go on to write Toriko, Build King, and be in jail for two years for having sex with an underage prostitute. Leader then follows Takeshi, who is born with the body of a grown man. His dad is a big CEO of a company, and now Takeshi wants to strive to be a great leader, just like him. The series is mainly realistic in its setting, with the weirdness of the characters making the comedy. Sometimes they'll go into more fantastical places, but that's mainly for special events like a gang war or a tournament arc. I will fully warn you all that this series does rely on toilet humor often. However, I think it's used wisely as the jokes are still well paced regardless. I personally believe with gag comedy you have to sort of get on the level of the material. If you go into one trying to get the material to match your humor sensibilities, you'll be disappointed often. Trying to change your sense of humor to match that of the author will get you to enjoy more of them. One thing that makes this series stick out in my brain is that it uses comedy and silly stories to teach the youth about what it means to be a good leader. Things like making failures into a learning opportunity, or the importance of working hard towards a common goal. As an educator and a leader of the school I work for's music program, I can't recommend Sekimatsu Leader Den Takeshi enough. It's time to do 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 Super Psychic Policeman Choyo is the newest gag manga from Shonen Jump created by Numa Shun. And I'm gonna be talking about it, especially Chapter 3, because that revolves around Yu-Gi-Oh! Well, the basic synopsis there is Choyo and his comrade, now Pyongi, becomes like security for a card game tournament, and of course Choyo takes part in it. And let's just say he likes bullying kids and acting extremely smug about winning against kids. You fool! I activate my projected magical configuration trap card! Then I summon Efreet from my hand! The reflected damage means it's game over! Yeah. Of course, we're gonna be battling it out with a character literally called It's My Turn and referencing Yu Gi Oh! while we are at it. Well, the basic premise is go to a card game and a card gets stolen and we find the criminal and then uh, make a Yu Gi Oh! reference and then, of course, play more card games. And, well, of course, acting more smug about it. And, of course, this is not everything Choyo has to offer, it's just. It very much highlights what type of a person Choyo is and what kinds of things you can expect from this series. So, I mean, if you like comedy, if you like reference humor, if you like, you know, humor that's probably for a child, yeah, then, then read it. It's funny. All these manga are pretty varied. They came from different periods of time and saw different levels of success, but managed to last in Jump a good while, showcasing how popular gags are in Jump from its inception to this day. Especially the last one, Super Psychic Policeman Chojo, which is one of Jump's newer manga that's doing quite well for itself, selling decently and getting a frankly absurd number of colour pages in its first block of chapters. Which may ruffle some feathers as some other western fan favourite action series might get axed while it stays in the magazine, which sounds suspiciously like another comedy manga I've mentioned a few times already. <laughs> Roboco is one of the best manga of all time, and I guess what I like the most about it is how much better it is than Phantom Seer. I mean, it's more original than Phantom Seer ever was. You have the totally original characters. You have the completely original volume covers. Obviously, it's funnier than Phantom Seer. Phantom Seer wasn't funny at all. I mean, it's funny how fast it ended, but that's about it. 
So yeah, it's clearly better than Phantom Seer, and I think everyone will agree when I say that it's already better than anything in Kagurabachi. Now, in all seriousness, Roboco has been one of my favorite manga ever since I started it a couple of years ago. I love the humor in this manga. I mean, the joke about wanting a younger sibling in Chapter 1 is still one of the wildest jokes in a jump manga I've ever seen. And it's just one of those series where I think all of the characters are my favorite character. Like, if you asked me to pick one, I couldn't because I just like them all so much. The jokes can be hit or miss like plenty of other series, but I love the gags, I love the meathead humor, and I love the characters. So if you're looking for a gag comedy to follow every week, then I cannot recommend Roboco enough. I'd recommend Phantom Seer, but I guess you can't really read it anymore, now can you? Nani? This has been a rather unavoidable topic of discussion when talking about Jump generally. The comedy and gag manga of the magazine are often looked down upon or flat out hated because people do not like that manga like me and Roboco or Chojo get to remain in the magazine while their favorites get cancelled. While I do sympathize with seeing your favorites get cancelled while something you like less remains, how dare you last longer than Ayashimon? I'm also pretty saddened sometimes by how others view comedy manga in Jump and in general. As I've illustrated, comedy manga were pivotal to the magazine and play a big part in why it was successful. They also contribute to the magazine's variety, which is something that's always been overlooked. Jump isn't just a battle manga magazine. Frankly, there's a lot of non-battle series in it which people refuse to acknowledge, comedy manga included. Hi, my name's Harold, and I'm here to talk about Witch Watch. Witch Watch by Kenta Shinohara follows Niko Wakatsuki, a teenage witch who moves in with her childhood friend Morihito Otogi, a human-like ogre, after finishing her magical training. Morihito is assigned to become Niko's familiar and protect her from a looming threat. From this simple premise, we get a story with clever comedy, romance, decent fights, and some deep, wholesome moments as well. Witch Watch is hilarious and has definitely made me laugh out loud a couple times. A lot of the comedy comes from Nico trying out new spells on Morihito and the others with good intentions, but the spells end up backfiring or have a crazy side effect that the gang has to either figure out a way to undo or just survive until it undoes itself. The romance is also a nice aspect of the story. It's, it's nice. nice to see characters like Nico and Morihito, who were childhood friends, grow closer to each other and how their feelings towards each other begin to develop over time. When the series wants to get serious and be a battle shonen, it could show out too with some pretty decent fights. I'd say Morihito has the best fights since he's the strongest of Nico's familiars, but the other familiars get down too. The artwork during the action scenes is great, and thanks to the art style of Witch Watch, the transition from comedy to serious isn't jarring. The highlight of the series for me is the whole cast of characters. From the main cast, the supporting, and the antagonists, all the characters are great. And they each have their own depth and go through their own character arcs developing over time. It's not the kind of comedy where the characters and the status quo stay the same until the end of time. There is variety in the characters and setting as the story progresses, and that's something I appreciate. If you're looking for a gag manga to read with your lineup of pot shown and jump titles, definitely check out Witch Watch. It's a great read. Sometimes people forget or just don't know that Jump is a physical magazine, which is where the TOC or Table of Contents come into play. There's frankly a lot of irritating discussion of it online, but if you boil it down to brass tacks, the Table of Contents is a recommended reading order for you. And it seems editorial want you to finish up your week with something light and funny usually. For now, Yokai Buster Murakami occupies this spot. But works like Isobi Isobi Monogatari and Pyu Tofuku Jaguar have also been there. Smaller, shorter works for you to finish up your weekly read with. Of course, you can completely ignore the TOC and skip around to wherever you want, but this is an intentional choice, I think. Upcoming spoilers for Jujutsu Kaisen chapter 245 and One Piece chapter 1119. Please skip ahead to this point in the video if you don't want to be spoiled. I will leave a timestamp down below. 
Another thing I want to highlight is even in these big battle manga, comedy elements are often present. Jujutsu Kaisen's promo for the 27th volume featuring Takeba so heavily has been great since the standout part of this volume contains the mini arc involving the Manzai comedy skits with Kenjaku and Takeba, and frankly this story arc is the most I've enjoyed the series in a long while. Maybe Gege should make a gag manga next, just saying. It brought some much needed gravity to the story and showcases a character with a terrifically fun ability, highlighting what I think is Gege at his strongest and most creative. And then we get to One Piece, the flagship title of the magazine which has tons of funny comedy bits throughout. But recently with the advent of the Nika Nika no Mi reveal, the series has changed a bit. Luffy is now the embodiment of fun, wacky antics. His powers now let him be a living cartoon, which intersect with the series' themes of freedom and societal upheaval really well. Bringing laughter and smiles to people brings them together, which is what Luffy has been doing the entire series up until now, and now he's even more adept at this by fully embracing the silliness the world of One Piece has to offer. It's goofy, but I also think a meaningful commentary on how funny things, comedy, gags, and jokes can bring people together. The power of making people smile and having hope through these things is powerful and uniting. It's something Jump's always done, and One Piece is weirdly taking that full circle by merging the battle shonen the magazine's always been known for, as well as the silly gag manga that have been the hidden spine of Weekly Shonen Jump this entire time. It also perfectly captures the message I I want to convey with this video too, I think. Comedy is a powerful tool, and it might not seem hype as the cool new fight in whatever manga is currently trending, or as emotionally devastating as a death or romantic confession, but the happiness you get from a joke, no matter how small, is really important. It can really make your day in some cases if you just let it. And I think more people should read comedy manga and try to engage with them, because why are we even alive if not to feel happiness? Embrace how silly the world can be sometimes. Find joy in any little thing you can, because this isn't gonna last forever. Kochikame didn't, and that was already huge. Although Roboko might, I think that series will last until the end of time. As the name suggests, in High School Family we follow a family of five, father, mother, son, daughter, and cat, as they all enter their first year of high school. It's a very ridiculous concept that preps you to be open to all the strange things it does for the sake of the joke. Now, while High School Family has countless great chapters you could tackle, I think one that really expresses the unique humor of the series would have to be Chapter 40. This chapter is led by Gomez, the family cat who, as mentioned before, is going to high school along with his family. But what you have to understand is, he's not a talking cat, or even an especially intelligent one. By all accounts, he's literally just a cat. We open with Gomez being bullied by a bunch of street cats, and to combat this, he simply stands intimidatingly on two legs. One can assume this crime against nature did the trick, because the cats fled on sight. But a local policeman catches wind of him and his high school uniform, and brings him in for questioning. Not because he's curious as to why a cat is in a high school uniform, but because he needs to stop this street scuffle. What follows is a series of great gags with the man trying to talk some sense into Gomez. But Gomez throws up a hairball in his paperwork, steals his gun to play with, and runs from the authorities. The chapter gets more and more ridiculous, culminating in Gomez returning to the scene of the original crime, only to reveal that the whole time, he was actually protecting a young kitten from those feline fiends. Above all else, High School Family excels at its ridiculous imagery, presenting the most ridiculous scenes in the most serious of ways. And I believe the best way to enjoy the series is to fully embrace the chaos and accept what it shows you. At the very least, I don't think there's any gag manga I connect to more. I know not every comedy will appeal to each person though, but try not to discount the genre as a whole. Something will make you laugh at some point, especially if you open yourself up to it. It might not happen immediately, but you can turn that silly manga and jump you don't like into something that might make you laugh now and again. 
This video also has so many collaborators pitching in and talking about different series for a legitimate reason too, because we're all different as people and I think at least one series someone mentions in this video will stand out to you and bring you joy. Comedy is a diverse genre which we're barely scratching the surface of and I'm not gonna lie there's some manga people are talking about today which never did click with me and I didn't really find too funny and that's perfectly fine. You won't find everything mentioned in this video funny, probably. If you do though you've got a lot of fun stuff to read potentially. But yeah, comedy is subjective. One thing someone finds funny, someone else won't. But this video is featuring so many comedy manga that you'll likely find something that tickles your fancy here. And even if you don't read manga, I think this still applies. I actually reached out to my friend who doesn't really read much manga for this video so he can tell you his thoughts on his favorite comedy manga too. Yeah, you know I got that for an office friend. Come on, yeah. Boom. It all started when I was walking down the road. I spotted a little book library, decided to check it out. Usually there's nothing too interesting in these, but a One Piece volume. Awesome. When I opened it, I found Water Luffy. Funniest thing I'd ever seen. It was hilarious. A real knee slapper. I laughed so hard, uh, I, I, I fainted. And when I came to, I saw the hilarity of Water Luffy, obviously, but I also saw something very unassuming ghost stories i opened it up and it was so spooky i was shaking and shiver me timbers interestingly enough though there's comedy manga side story at the end of this spooky manga and that's what i'm here to talk about comedy can be found in many different places in one piece you'd expect to find adventure wacky powers and stressful battles but there are still little beads of comedy. In Ghost Hunt, you'd expect interpersonal conflicts, supernatural phenomena with spooky, tense scenes. Oddly enough, in Ghost Hunt Volume 2, there is an entirely dedicated 50 pages of a comedic slice-of-life side story, where the characters are reintroduced as if this was meant to be a standalone experience. It's filled with little gags and funny happenstance, as well as the supernatural element taking the form of neither a potential high school haunting or a child-possessed doll tra tragedy, I can't say that, <laughs> but that of a mischievous extraordinary prankster ghost. Currently halting the production of a film in a local park, whenever the cameras are rolling, the actor and actress posing as a couple get drenched as if a giant balloon of water bursts from the thin air above their heads. No suspicious persons are spotted, leaving our ghost-busting team to discern the true meaning of these mischievous incidents. Our protagonist, the part-timer ghost-catching May, has feelings developing on a certain someone on the crew. To usher forward the jealousy of this couple-hating ghostly prankster, the team pair up and pose as couples enjoying the park. May, instead of having the chance to feel what it might like to be with that certain somebody, is paired up with a laid-back, middle-aged monk. They make for a very unconvincing and bumbling couple, while the more stoic characters are goggled at for their compatibility. Still, May and the old man monk manage to invoke the wrath of the prankster ghost. Now there are some potentially heavy themes, so a content warning stands for relationship and depression related things, but they are carried in a light-hearted way without being disrespectful to the subject matter, making it a perfectly kind-hearted and comedic side story that stayed just as memorable and complete as the spookier and more tragic main story. I know that this might have been an atypical example, but I hope you enjoyed me walking you through the side story of Volume 2 Ghost Hunt. Thank you. I love that Freddy's exposure to One Piece has been a major comedic element, and it might be what he associates most with the series for now. And Ghost Hunt, the only shoujo manga someone brought up, is another one that he at least partly remembers for comedic aspects. It goes to show that anyone can have fun with comedy manga or comedy in manga. Since I've been yapping about jump manga predominantly for this video so far, let's have a look at some of the other shonen magazines and what kind of comedy they have to offer. First off, we have one from Jump's biggest rival, Weekly Shonen Magazine. Released on the Shonen Magazine between 2005 and 2012, receiving three anime seasons and a few OVAs, I was surprised I had never heard about. Sayonara Setsuo Sensei, or Goodbye Mr. Despair. It's about an incredibly depressed, a little suicidal, well, very suicidal, high school teacher called Nosomo Itoshiki. He 
he frequently goes into rants about life and society to all his students, all of them having weird and unique personalities, including Kafu Kafura, which is his exact opposite, being instead extremely positive and normally twisting his complaints into something positive. Most chapters follow up the cycle of the rant, a few examples, then the positive outcome and then a crazy joke that sometimes is over the top and nonsensical, turning the manga from a seemingly normal slice of life to something completely insane that you would never expect. It's quite the text-heavy comedy manga, visual gags are mostly just kept to the end. It also has a few Japanese references that you might not get, but at least every chapter has translator notes. On the 14 officially translated volumes and the other fan translated 160 chapters, 300 chapters is quite enough content for this. And another manga from a shonen magazine, as well as a classic modern comedy manga, is Nishijo, but I'll let Otaku Khan do the talking. So when I think about a comedy manga in general that makes me laugh every time, I think about Nichijou. Nichijou could be the most obvious choice for a gag comedy manga to point out, but Nichijou just loves to go beyond randomness and somehow made every chapter worth reading. Nichijou is just about the daily antics around a group of high school girls and their normal but somehow very quirk and random lives. Sometimes you can't really explain how great Nichijou is as this has multiple layers of different jokes that builds up to another one, then another one on top of that, and it really uses the element of surprise really well. One chapter you have two students talking, then all of a sudden one pulls out a cannon or a missile or something out of nowhere, and then the next chapter could be the principal German suplexing a deer. Yeah, it is that random. Nichijo is just hilarious, I just love it so much, it's very comforting, I just love spending every moment to sit down and read it. And it's not a shonen manga, but since I know a lot of people love Nishijo, its author Keichi Arawi also has a manga called City, which I'll let Secret Doves tell you about. The manga I'm introducing is City by Keichi Arawi. Now Arawi is famous for Nichijo. This is kind of a follow-up to Nichijo, although it is unrelated overall story. It's also a much bigger concept than Nichijo. Nichijo is sort of the straightforward, absurdist, slice of life gag manga full of um, Arawi's signature slapstick humor, which is great. And City has a lot of that same stuff, but he's building it out into a bigger concept, a whole city full of people with their own jokes, with their own storylines, with their own slice of life, you know, tiny little low stakes dramas that he builds out into these wonderful narratives. And the thing, the big ambition here is he's going to weave them together. Now that works better sometimes than other times. It can be a kind of a mess in certain moments and just get kind of confusing, but at its best, it's there's nothing else like it. And my favorite moment from the story, my favorite gag, I guess you'd say, are these four pages right here, where at the end of one big storyline, all of these different people are coming together, all these different jokes are coming together, every single thing happening on the page has been established, has been set up. It, these are 50 punchlines to 50 different jokes happening in four pages right here in these wonderful Where's Waldo spreads. Absolutely masterful. Love this moment in the series, love the series overall, even if it's mm, hit or miss sometimes, it's still going to be fun. Arawi knows how to make some jokes, so definitely give it a try. You'll have a good time. You might have your mind expanded. What in the goddamn? 
And another big rival Shonen magazine for Jump is Weekly Shonen Sunday, in which we have a bit of an older comedy manga, which Manga Crash will tell you about. Let me introduce you to a manga that starts with our main character walking into a school and stepping on a landmine that explodes in his face. That landmine was put there by the owl monitor that doesn't want anyone to get late to school. So our character tells him that it's not actually late. In fact, he's a transfer student in his first day and he was told by the professor himself to arrive after the first period ended. To which the owl monitor responds with, well, yeah, okay, well, what if your teacher told you to die? Those are the introductory pages of Blazing Transfer Student, the 1983 shonen Sunday manga by mangaka Kazuhiko Shimamoto, and it only gets weirder from there on out. Blazing Transfer Student grabs the over-the-topness and cheesiness of 80s manga and just injects it with steroids, making essentially the most over-the-top manga I've ever read in my entire life. This story is about two boys with absolutely zero IQ and the girl that they both like, as the three of them keep transferring between schools over and over again and they find themselves fighting against each other over multiple sports. And I think what makes this manga hilarious are two reasons. First of all is the kind of dialogues that I've already told you an example of, and the second is how insane the sports are. The first sports that they practice is a, a volleyball match that lasts for three entire days where the characters are actually knocking each other out and instead of going for points they're just trying to absolutely kill the other team. We also have the most iconic part of the manga that was actually adapted into an OVA that sees our main character in a boxing match not being able to deliver his powerful punch because he can't actually say the name of the punch before the other character punches him. Overall, I don't think Blazing Transfer Student is the best manga I've ever read. In the words of its own mangaka, the art sucks, the story makes absolutely no sense, and it has so much energy that sometimes it's kind of hard to read. But what I can say about it more than any others is that this is the manga that made me laugh out loud the most out of over 700 manga that I've read, and just because of that I think you should give it a chance. It's not just Jump that has a rich history with gag manga as well. They've been important elsewhere and even now the big shonen magazines feature comedic works. Weekly Shonen Magazine for instance is filled with rom-coms, some more coms than rom, with Kanan-sama is easy as hell being a shorter weekly read of about 8 pages featuring a bratty demon who gets roped into being a human's lover because she's surprisingly pure-hearted, juxtaposing her haughty demoness attitude with her instantly folding when anything sexual or romantic gets involved since she's too shy. Weekly Shonen Sunday has Shibuya Nia Family, another shorter six-page weekly manga by the author of Sayonara Zetsubo Sensei that follows a grade schooler and family living in Shibuya. It's a bit more wordy with a lot of setup and seemingly more jokes revolving around referential and word-based humour. Shonen Champion has Furuto on Thursday, a shorter strip-like comic following a cat named Furuto who lives with a manga artist that tells short comedic bits in just two pages. Comedy is alive and well in the manga world, as it will be forever, and I've given so many examples myself, so let's have one last round of collaborators tell you their favourites, which I've saved for the very end of this video. Hopefully you'll find something that takes your fancy. I go by a few different names online, but for right now, I'll say that you can call me Yellowtail. I'm a manga scan later, which encompasses a whole lot, but right now, I am one of the typesetters for the fan release of The Jojo Land, as well as the solo translator and letterer for a number of Shonen Jump one-shots that I totally encourage you to check out. Specifically among them is Nande Nanda-san. The first Shonen Jump series that I ever got emotionally attached to was The Hunter's Guild, Red Hood, published from early summer to late fall of 2021. Every week, I'd frantically rave with maybe one or two other people on the internet about the table of contents positions of this series, the highs of seeing this series that we, the exclusive few who knew its greatness, its potential, understood was better than any other serial, veteran or newcomer in the magazine. But it would fall lower and lower until eventually it finally ended its run that November, culminating in a wave of emotion so strong that I made a video essay praising it, now hidden deep in the recesses of YouTube somewhere. When that last chapter was published, 
all fell into radio silence. The work of the author Yuki Kawaguchi, he who I loved so dearly, faded into obscurity. A few months later, in May 2022, long after I grieved, he published a one-shot in Jump to little to no fanfare. I was ecstatic, my favorite mangaka back from the dead. But this is shown in Jump. We don't translate one-shots here, so I figured, screw that. I'll do it myself. The one-shot itself is gorgeous. It was more of Kawaguchi's wonderful command of facial expression on chibi figures, and it had an overwhelming amount of heart to it for a gag manga. It instilled in me a love of one-shots and a desire to find out what else is hidden in there. Nande Nanda-san was reassuring to me that a mangaka that I so loved would someday return when the time was right and was my introduction into my niche hobby of translating and localizing overlooked Shonen Jump one-shots. I've made so many friends along the way, found so many more passionate fans of manga that I care about, and I thought nobody else liked. And Nande Nanda-san catalyzing that for me is something for which I'll ever be grateful. Fruit salad, yummy, yummy. The main source of comedy in Tsuru Hatamune's Service Wars is its exaggeration of everyday situations using the shonen battle manga structure. The way it exaggerates these normal complaining customers into these bizarre monsters of the week creates these genuinely interesting high octane battles using regular everyday items like a barcode scanner, bagels, and hot compresses, resulting in a balance being struck between interesting action where the audience is genuinely curious about who's going to win and how, and comedy in the ridiculousness of the situations unfolding. Hatamune's art also accentuates this with several bizarre visuals and each character having very extravagant designs, instantly making that character stand out from the other characters as well as informing the audience about their personality and occupation. Service Wars is also very rarely tongue-in-cheek acknowledging the humor of the series, allowing the series to shine on its own without the audience needing to be told that it is funny. The seriousness with which Service Wars addresses even its most ridiculous plot points allows the audience to better appreciate the humor of the series because of how far it is willing to take its premise and its humor. Within its short 37 chapter runtime, Service Works is able to tell a compelling story with several entertaining gags, all wrapped up in a very appealing art style. With its absurd visuals, over the top character designs, and larger than life personalities, Service Wars is able to continue to make me laugh on reread after reread. If I were to pitch Teenage Renaissance David in one sentence, it would be lowbrow humor from high art. That's certainly how it starts, and it's what the main hook is, especially from a glance. I was in the middle of art school when Teenage Renaissance David was being published, and it couldn't have come to me at a better time. I spent all day learning about art history, different artistic techniques, and their implementation, and suddenly this comedy manga has them interacting with each other? Okay, sign me up. The setup is that Michelangelo's David attends high school and has a crush on Sandra Botticelli Shelley's The Birth of Venus. David's friend, Jerome Duskinoy's Mannequin Piss, helps his friend out of his shell to not only experience high school to the fullest, but also to get to know Venus and shortly after the wider cast of characters, including, but not limited to, Mona Lisa, Goliath and Lamy, Leda and the Swan, and even Boca della Verita and the Statue of Liberty make appearances. The heart of the series is the artist's interpretation of the characters. Yes, you're reading what is effectively a fanfiction involving the mangaka's favorite pieces of art and culture interacting with each other, but over the tragically short four-volume run, the series' throughline is executed quite well. It's a heartwarming, goofy story about the peaks and valleys of teenagehood, with a pretty nice meta aspect in regards to the art pieces presented. You could be one of the most famous sculptures or paintings in the world and still have trouble confessing to someone you like. You could also feel insecure about your interests, or be standoffish, or obsessed with Shonen Jump. Hey, wait a second. The mangaka Yushin Kuroki is a very skilled artist who, as mentioned earlier, wears his influences quite literally on his sleeve with the depictions of the characters. Like many a shonen manga, his depictions of female characters showcase eccentricities that will no doubt put off a few if you don't know what you're getting into. But also, he's not afraid to undercut his cast for the sake of a funny joke, which again is worked back into the series' overall forward momentum. I wasn't able to track down his previous work, but this seems to be his only series to be published overseas at all. It's a shame it ended after only 30 Five. chapters, as upon a reread I fell into its rhythm all over again. I wish it ran as long as something like Isobi Isobi Monogatari. 
I think it could have occupied a space in the back of the magazine quite comfortably as the end of week fun for Jump is a weekly publication. That being said, it's available on the Linda. Plus app if it looks interesting to you. Yushin Kuroki even has a YouTube channel where they still draw the characters, so if you read the series and enjoy it, maybe leave them a nice comment or something. That's all I have to say. Please check out Teenage Renaissance David. And that last one, Teenage Renaissance David Kun, is a fairly special manga for me too, so I wanted to save it for last. Being an artist myself, an art comedy series really appealed to me when I first read it, and it was also the very first axed manga I ever read up until its very end. Potentially being a big part of my journey as a fan of Shonen Jump, axed manga, and manga magazines as a whole, you might not have gotten to see this video or even my entire channel if it weren't for David Kun. I sincerely hope that after watching this, you found some cool new comedy manga to check out and perhaps your appreciation for manga like this has grown. Please read more comedy manga, that is the point of this video. Read more silly stuff, be happier and share that manga and happiness with others. This has been a massive collaborative effort and having friendly people give their thoughts was pivotal to my ideas for this video. I couldn't have done it without everyone, so thank you very much. But before you go, and before I fully wrap this video up with the usual Patreon credits, I want to fully thank everyone, including individually plugging some cool stuff they've been doing. A ton of cool creative people helped make this video, and some have channels or projects that are worth taking a peek at, so to be non-biased, I'm going to thank everyone alphabetically, with one exception. A huge thanks to Stell, at Stellala on Twitter, who did the thumbnail art for this video. I've been a massive fan of her art for the longest time, and I think it was the perfect fit for this type of video. Here's some neat behind the scenes sketches of the thumbnails as well. Absolutely go follow her, look at all the cool Roboco fan art, her OC piss boy, and keep an eye out on her webtoon because someday she's gonna pop off big time with something seriously cool. Links in the description. Now going through everyone alphabetically, first we have Andrew who did the section on David Kuhn. You can find them on Twitter at AndrewAmper5and where they post some great illustrations. I really like the Gundam one specifically. And you can also find them on YouTube at Neptune Cactus, and they told me to plug their over 40 minute video essay on Snow White, so go check that out. Speaking of cactuses, we have Cactus, one of my best friends who instantly nabbed Gintama, so blame him if I told you you can cover it. Take him to Detroit. No! No, not Detroit! No! No, please! Anything but that! No! Cactus told me to plug today's sponsor, Raid Shadow Legends. No, that's a joke, I'm not shilling a shitty mobile game. What he did actually tell me to plug was the manga Hoseki no Kuni or Land of the Lustrous, which is a fantastic read, so go read that, as well as Guilty Gear Strive, an absolute banger of a fighting game, which more people should play, and I'd love to talk about it on the channel someday. You also might hear characters pop up in some future videos involving film, since we both love watching bad movies together, so subscribe for that eventually. Also, if for some reason you're in the market for modelled cars in Russia, he makes them. There'll be a link in the description if that's your niche. Next up we have Faco, who did the Bocce the Rock section and you can find them at It's Faco on Twitter and It's Faco on YouTube, where they have a number of video essays on anime and manga, including one on Bocce the Rock. The link to it will be in the description, and I highly encourage people to sub to them. I don't know how a channel of this quality has less than 500 subs. They should steal some of mine for real. We then have Harold, who did the section on Witch Watch. Really glad we had someone on board to cover it, as I think it's a pretty underrated manga from Jump's current lineup. You can find them on Twitter at Harold with two O's. Inspirashimu is next and you can find them on Twitter and YouTube with the same name. They're responsible for the Grand Blue section and have a great channel full of videos on Land of the Lustrous, which is a manga along with Cactus they also wanted to plug. So just go read it already if you haven't. They also told me that their Natural Historian series will begin in 6 months, so subscribe and stay tuned for that. Joe Carter is next, who did the section for Dr. Slum. You can find them at Joe Carter on Twitter and on YouTube. 
where you can find a ton of videos on manga and anime, including some on Roboco, like their Every Dragon Ball reference in Me and Roboco. Subscribe and check them out. I think watchers of this channel will probably also really enjoy theirs. Next up we have Kinocha, who did the section on High School Family, making every Gomez fan extremely happy. You can find them at their YouTube channel with the same name, which is another one that's highly underrated, and they've given me a video on k -On they'd like to plug. They're super close to 100 subs and a thousand views on that video, so subscribe and give that one a watch to push those numbers up a little bit more. Links will be in the description. We then have Manga Crash, who everyone should be subbed to by now. Find them at Manga Crash on Twitter and YouTube. They did the section on Blazing Transfer Student, and I cannot recommend their channel enough since they're one of the main inspirations for mine. They have some great videos on Shonen Jump, Stop Hibaru-kun, and tons of other videos pertinent to the kind of things I also talk about. I'm going to recommend their video on revisiting Dragon Ball in 2024 though, since I think it's one of Crash's best videos that I don't think has gotten enough love, so please go watch that one. Mask or Mark did the section on Leave It to Pet. They also have a YouTube channel under the same name and have recently published the novel Traveller, which I'll leave a link to in the description. Melons, who did the section on Sekimatsu leader Den Takeshi, can be found at Melons in My Attic on Twitter, where you can find him often talking about Weekly Shonen Jump every week, as well as breaking down and posting cool statistical graphs about the magazine. MG, or literally just MG on Twitter, did the section on Sket Dance, and that's where you can find them. Freddy, or My Freddo, who did the segment on One Piece and Ghost Hunt, can be found at MyFreddo898 on YouTube, where you'll find camping vlogs, book reviews, full albums, Pokemon card openings, and six hour long Game of the Year podcasts featuring yours truly. I've been best friends with him for so many years and his videos are a joy to watch, so please subscribe. We'll also probably end up making a bunch of silly stuff together in the future too, so stay tuned. Next we have Otaku-kan, who did the Nishijo segment. You can find them at Otaku-kan on Twitter and YouTube, where they have a ton of videos on all sorts of different manga, so go subscribe, because I think they're another one of these smaller, underrated manga channels. Porsche was responsible for the Service Wars segment, and they can be found at Limegarten on Twitter, as well as under the name Dr. Jones on Manga Plus Creators or Medibang, where you can find their comic All's Fair. Go have a read, the link will be in the description. We then have Santi, who did the section on Sayonara Zetsuo Sensei, and they can be found at 621 Santi Salas, where they post some really cute drawings. Give them a follow on Twitter. Secret Doves, who covered City, can be found under that name on Twitter, where they can be found talking about Chainsaw Man and Tatsuki Fujimoto, which is something they also do on their podcast, the Public Safety Special Broadcast, which features all sorts of guests talking about, you guessed it, Chainsaw Man, so give it a sub and a listen. Shonen Oji covered Me and Roboco, and they can be found under the same name on Twitter and YouTube, where you can find a ton of videos covering a lot of shonen manga, which I think viewers of this channel would probably really also enjoy, so give them a sub. Yi Yi As did the section on Super Psychic Policeman Jojo and can be found at Yi As on Twitter, as well as Yi Yi As 666 on YouTube, where they've made a range of videos on anime and manga. Go check them out. And finally, last but certainly not least, is Yellowtail, who can be found at Wistful Yellow on Twitter, and they covered Nande Nande san. They've also been a big force in translating some recent Shonen Jump one shots, which I've covered in a recent video, where you can find all the links to those one shots there, or under the Project Vinland Scanlation group, which is on Manga Dex. There also may be a translation of Koi no Yobi no Sezaki-san on the way, which could be out before this video or after, so keep an eye out on their Twitter and give them a follow just in case. Again, thank you all for participating and please check out these cool peeps and what they make. And speaking of checking out cool stuff people make, 
please subscribe and check out the other manga related videos on the channel. I like to cover Shonen Jump a lot, its history in particular, which I have an entire series on, as well as videos on more recent axed or cancelled manga. If you want to hear me talk about other manga magazines though, I also have a recent video on Shonen Jump's rivals, which people seem to like. If you really enjoyed this video and want to support me, which I would be incredibly grateful for, as I'd like to keep making more big videos like this, you can join my Patreon for as little as $1 a month. Or for $3, you can get a little doodle, as well as be thanked at the end of videos like Kinocha, Cody, Kaizuku Gairu, Sorokul Zero, Holly the Apothecary, and Mayu. Thank you all so much for being patrons. And as always, thank you for watching, remember to be kind, and take care.